Today's forecast calls for a blustery 60 degrees below zero. Atmospheric pressure so low, your blood will boil. And a global dust storm that will blot out the sun for the next three months. Weather like that would be unprecedented on Earth, but it's just a typical daily forecast on Mars. A forecast you wouldn't survive. Taking your spacesuit off on the planet Mars is not a good thing. The first thing you notice is that the pressure is very, very low. Your body fluids would literally start boiling instantly. Mars today is a frozen wasteland, choking in dust and swept by whirlwinds as high as Mount Everest. But once it was a paradise very similar to Earth, how did Mars go so terribly wrong? And what would happen if Earth had to face this fate tomorrow? Earth's is just one kind of weather. On other planets, there are storms beyond the imagination, climates and conditions that we hope to never see on Earth. But could they happen here? And if so, could we survive deadliest space weather? This morning, the sun rises over a devastated Earth. Our balmy weather has been blasted away, replaced by the icy near vacuum of Mars. Mighty rivers boil and freeze at the same instant. Towering whirlwinds of dust swallow our cities. And in places like sunny Southern California, it's lights out. Luckily for Earth, disasters like these have spared us so far. But why have they happened to Mars? Thanks to NASA missions like the Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity rovers, we know that the fourth planet from the Sun, with half the Earth's diameter and a third of its gravity, has the most Earth-like weather of any known planet. It has distinct seasons. It's got two polar caps. It's got an atmosphere that can sustain ferocious winds. It's got dust storms like over the Sahara Desert on Earth. Looks like kind of a livable place. But weather-wise, that's where the similarities end. Earth's average temperature is a balmy 59 degrees. The Martian average is about 80 below zero, and it sometimes dips to 225 below at the poles. You might think that Mars is so cold simply because it's farther from the sun, but that's only partly true. More importantly is that the atmosphere is so thin, and so its greenhouse effect is so small. The amount of air in the atmosphere is 100 times less. You'd have to go up 20 miles high on Earth to get to a place that the pressure is as low as it is on Mars. Aside from turning Mars so frigidly cold, this super thin atmosphere creates perhaps the defining difference between Earth and Mars. The fact that water cannot exist as a liquid on the surface of the red planet. If I were to land on Mars with a glass of water and expose water to the near vacuum of outer space on the surface of Mars, it would boil, boil all by itself. Why would water on Mars boil away? It all goes back to the lack of air pressure. The boiling point of water depends on the atmospheric pressure. If you were to go to the top of Mount Everest, you would realize that water boils at a much lower temperature at the top of a mountain. So if you were to drop the pressure extremely, for example, only having 1% the pressure here on Earth, such as the Martian surface atmosphere, then you could get water to boil at extremely low temperatures. So we can actually do that here with this vacuum chamber. So let me open this up. Put in the water. Seal it up and switch it on. So the pump is pulling out the air, and indeed, there it begins to boil. So what would happen on Earth if the air pressure dropped to the pressure of Mars? St. Louis, Missouri, 
As the barometric pressure sky dies from a normal 1,013 millibars to only 7.5, the mighty Mississippi is about to flow into oblivion. Old Man River will start to boil as the pressure drops. We would see the river fall, uh, a cloud rise, the cloud quickly dissipate. We would see the water level in the Mississippi just drop, 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 drop. Within minutes, the atmosphere above would plunge to 60 below zero. The Mississippi would end up looking very much like what appear to be dry stream beds on Mars today. Since Mars's atmosphere is too thin and dry to maintain a stable temperature, it suffers violent 100 degree temperature swings from day to night. All that heating and cooling generates powerful winds and powerful winds generate these, the most active and towering dust devils yet discovered. How do these monsters form? It all starts with two basics of Martian weather, constant wind and the pervasive dust that gives the red planet its name. Wind over time is slowly eroding the surface rocks and that generates this dust which is incredibly fine. It's pink colored and that's because of rust, ferric oxide. It's like talcum powder, a very fine powder, very easy to sweep up into the atmosphere. The Martian atmosphere has a reddish glow because this red dust is expended in the atmosphere for long periods of time. All that dust creates armies of dusty cyclones, but meteorologists call them dust devils, not tornadoes, because tornadoes require watery storm clouds that don't exist on Mars. Solar heating creates little hot spots in the desert, starts a swirling of air which picks up dirt. The dirt absorbs more sunlight, which increases the swirling. The next thing you know, you've got a little dust devil goes streaking across the distance. Images like these from NASA's Mars rovers often show several in a single shot. NASA scientists were astonished when dust devils passed right over the Mars rovers and vacuumed dust from their solar panels, boosting their energy and prolonging their lives. You look at the images taken from the rovers and you'll see the dust devils just traveling right by. It's not a surprise that one of them hit the rover itself and cleaned it off. But not all dust devils are harmless little vacuums. Some can morph into monsters that NASA has measured as taller than Mount Everest, dwarfing the greatest EF5 tornadoes on Earth. They can reach the heights of five or six miles high and be many hundreds or thousands of feet across. So what would happen if a giant Martian dust devil blew across the Earth? St. Louis, Missouri. If a Martian behemoth as high as Mount Everest approached the city's famous Gateway Arch, the path would be the width of St. Louis itself. It's so wide that you see a vacuum created inside, just as you would a tornado, but it's very, very much wider. So although the wind speed is less, the overall energy is just enormous. The dust devil would essentially bury St. Louis in its own debris. But the Gateway Arch would survive the fury, just barely. It's stainless steel coated, and so it would tend to shed the dust, and perhaps fittingly, the arch would stand as a shining monument. By pumping dust far into the upper atmosphere, Martian dust devils are key players in the planet's weather. But sometimes they go even further, morphing into meteorological monsters that could kill hundreds of millions if they ever erupted here. Mars is not the only planet in our solar system with major dust storms. On July 5, 2011, a dramatic dust storm swept towards Phoenix, Arizona,
towering up to 10,000 feet, it engulfed the city for over an hour, knocking out electricity to 10,000 customers and closing airports. But this is a minor dust storm compared to the global monsters that swallow Mars every few years. It shocked scientists when we first saw them as our probes flew past the surface of Mars. We were not used to the idea of planetary storms, storms that engulf the entire planet. The monster storm raged for a month, and average surface temperatures plunged by about 50 degrees. But how does Martian weather generate such planet-wide storms in the first place? It all begins when a local dust devil runs amok. In the summertime, at some points, intense sun heating creates a lot of dust being kicked up in a localized spot. The sun is heating the dust and not heating the material next to it. So you have this temperature differential between the advancing wall of dust and the air next to it, which tends to propagate. But once it's engulfed the entire planet, there's no edge anymore. There's no differential to keep it going. And so the vigorous circulation that caused it to spread stops. And then the dust just takes its sweet time to settle back down. How damaging would this be on Earth? Los Angeles. A towering wall of dust wells up from the south on its way to smothering the entire planet. At first, it blots out the sun. You would see the temperature drop on the order of 20 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and that would continue dropping over time. LA's lush lawns and gardens would start to wither and freeze. But there would be bigger problems for planet Earth. We would have a global food shortage very, very quickly. Uh, there wouldn't be water for the plants. Uh, there wouldn't be sunlight for the plants. There clearly would not be enough food produced on the planet to feed all the people on the planet. I don't think that humanity would die off completely in a three-month global dust storm, but it would probably kill on the order of a billion people, maybe a billion and a half people. Harsh weather like this is obviously deadly to life. Yet, Mars was once a warm and watery world where life very possibly thrived. We think that perhaps three billion years ago or so, Mars was covered with water. Great oceans, lakes, riverbeds. But for some reason, all the water disappeared. All this was possible because Mars once had a much thicker atmosphere. So where did it go? Mars is a smaller planet than Earth, so it lost its internal heat more rapidly. That means its iron core largely froze. And so a magnetic field was no longer being generated because you need a rotating liquid iron core. Earth's magnetic field protects our thick atmosphere by diverting the sun's charged particles around the planet. But once Mars lost its planet-wide magnetic field, charged particles from the sun were able to strip away parts of the atmosphere. That led to global cooling, so carbon dioxide started freezing out of the atmosphere. That meant that the greenhouse warming became less, thus even lower temperatures, more freezing, and so on. So sort of an inverse greenhouse effect appears to have happened on Mars. Today, with its original atmosphere largely gone, Mars cannot sustain water in its liquid form, at least on the surface. But is it possible that liquid water and life itself may be hiding in plain sight? Despite the lack of liquid H2O on Mars, it's actually a very watery planet. To understand where the water is hidden, scientists like Christopher McKay study the high elevation valleys of Antarctica here on Earth, where water is locked in the permafrost and never melts. When we go to the dry valleys of Antarctica, very high elevations, we get into conditions that, from the point of view of ice physics, are the closest to Mars. This is one of my favorite places on Earth to go, exactly because they are a model for Mars. We have a little bit of Mars right here on Earth. 
If you were to go to Mars and dig right into the surface, you would hit solid ice. We think that is just below the surface of Mars, permanent frozen water. In addition to permafrost, even more water is tied up in Mars's polar ice caps. Mars has polar caps, very reminiscent of Earth's polar caps, in that they grow in the winter and shrink in the summer. If you were to melt the polar caps on Mars, then the water would form a layer 30 or 40 feet thick over the entire surface of Mars. But Martian ice caps have a crucial difference from those here on Earth. In winter, they're covered by a 25-foot layer of frozen carbon dioxide, what we call dry ice. In the winter, it's so cold that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere condenses to form a huge winter polar cap. And then in summer, that all evaporates. The evaporating dry ice turns the Martian ice caps treacherous. The sun heats carbon dioxide below the surface, creating pockets of gas not too different from what's in a soda bottle. That gas then erupts in a very strong geyser, which releases not only this carbon dioxide into the air, but also a bunch of dust and debris that is carried along with the fast-moving atmosphere. It's going to fall out of the atmosphere onto the, the underlying ice, and that gives the appearance of a, a dark spot, what we refer to as the dark dune spots in the southern polar regions. Despite its harshness, Mars's weather is more similar to ours than any place we know of in the solar system. On the warmest summer days, the temperature can even hit 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But don't let that fool you into going out without a spacesuit. If you stepped out on Mars and, oh my gosh, you forgot your spacesuit, the first thing you notice is that the pressure is very, very low. Your body fluids would literally start boiling instantly you would start feeling pain in all your parts of your body which fluids are exposed. The next thing you notice would be that there's no oxygen to breathe. And then you would freeze solid. And then you would just sit there. You would not decay. A similar fate happens to climbers whose bodies are stranded on high peaks like Everest, including famous mountaineer George Mallory, who's been lying where he fell since 1924. There's no biological processes that would degrade you. Eventually, cosmic rays and ultraviolet light would decompose you, but that would take thousands to millions of years. Unless, of course, humans could somehow restore Mars's once temperate weather. But is terraforming the planet a science fiction fantasy or something actually within our grasp? This bitter weather seems to rule out life, at least on the frozen surface. The weather today on Mars is really not very supportive of life. Fundamentally, the pressure is too low for liquid water, and life needs liquid water. So it's very grim from a biological point of view. But recent evidence shows what seems to be liquid water, not on the surface, but welling up from underground. Those dark features are really strong evidence for a liquid. And the most likely liquid is water. Now, when we think water, we think of nice, fresh water that we're going to drink. I don't think that's the water here. I think this is a very salty solution. The saltiness is what allows it to be stable under the low pressure. But even salty water gives scientists hope that if life arose on ancient Mars, it might be hanging on in underground refuges. These gullies are very tantalizing. It might actually be water quite close to the surface, which means if there is liquid water under the surface, there could be life under the surface. Even if that proves true, Mars would remain an unlikely home for man. But some scientists already dream of changing that by terraforming the planet into a second Earth. One of the dreams of science fiction writers is to turn Mars into a Garden of Eden. And perhaps the key to that is to induce an artificial greenhouse effect. So why not inject greenhouse gases onto the surface of Mars? 
So that's one possibility. And as Mars begins to warm up, and as the greenhouse effect takes hold, it creates a positive feedback loop. We know that introducing greenhouse gases can raise temperatures. It's already happening on Earth. There are a number of greenhouse gases that are very strong greenhouse gases, which we could inject into the Martian atmosphere and warm the atmosphere up a great deal. NASA scientists speculate that if you build factories on Mars that poured out perfluorocarbons, a super potent greenhouse gas, you could warm the atmosphere by 14 degrees a century. At that rate, it would take about 800 years to reach the melting point of water. And then, the vast stores of water in the permafrost and the polar ice caps would begin to flow and enter the atmosphere. You have a thick atmosphere once again, a wet atmosphere once again, an atmosphere with rain once again, and an atmosphere that could support life. But these are just dreams of a distant future. In the meantime, scientists will keep studying the frozen secrets of Mars's weather and hope that what they learn will help us better understand the weather right here at home.